Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this webinar. Some of you may be joining us for the first time, so I will give you a short introduction about SUT. SUT is the Society for Underwater Technology. We are a multidisciplinary learned society, which was founded in 1966. We bring together organizations and individuals with a common interest in underwater technology, ocean science, and offshore engineering. You're here today for a SUT Plus webinar. SUT Plus is the subset of SUT for young professionals. We are run by developing professionals and cater to developing professionals, graduates, and students working in the sector. Like I mentioned, we have a global outreach. We have branches across the globe and we have members from more than 40 countries. So you'd be surprised to find some branches in the location where you are based. Some of the ways you can get in touch and be involved with the SET is you can check out our, our YouTube channel. There we record all our free webinars and upload them. And on our website, you can see all the future events that are there. And if you sign up to our newsletter using this QR code here, you will get the latest information via email. And lastly, we are quite active on LinkedIn as well. So you can follow our page and you'll get the latest updates there. Lastly, this is the contact details. If you want to check out our LinkedIn page or email us or view our website for more details. Without further ado, Claire, please let us know a little bit about yourself, your background, and how hydrogen will be playing a vital role in Scotland's future economy. Thank you. Great. No, th thanks very much for the introduction. I will just share my screen, if that's okay. Is is that all right? Can yes, we can, can see people see my slides? Great. So, um, my name is Claire Lavelle. I lead. Arab's energy business in the north, so covering Northern Ireland, Scotland, and the northeast of England. Um, I'm also uh, sit on the board of director of Scottish Renewables. Um, my background is very diverse across the energy sector, but I've got a particular focus on offshore wind, the energy transition, and hydrogen. And I'm involved in a number of key projects in the hydrogen space, which includes. Um, uh, supporting Scottish Government on their developing hydrogen policy, um, which is what I'm going to talk about today. But I'm also involved in some key hydrogen projects, um, which I'm also going to touch on in my presentation. Um, so just moving on, I, I just wanted to start with a little bit of context, which is that the long anticipated hydrogen economy is now within touching distance. So there's consensus from the Climate Change Committee, from UK and Scottish Government, that hydrogen is going to play a key role in decarbonising our energy system. It was point number two in Boris's 10 point plan. Um, and I'm sure some of you are wondering why after so many false starts that now is the time for this industry to come of age. Haven't we really heard all of this before? People have been talking about the hydrogen economy since the phrase was coined in the 1970s. Um, but the answer to that is really about net zero and what that means in terms of increased urgency in tackling climate change. So the requirement that we have now to wholly decarbonize our energy system means that we can no longer hide in the 20% and ignore the really difficult to decarbonize industries. And that's where hydrogen really comes in. Um, because it's got the potential to be a viable solution for applications where electrification just doesn't work. But it also, or net zero also means that we need a major shift in our energy system with a huge increasing reliance on electrification. And that creates some massive challenges, both in investing and in delivering of new electrical infrastructure, but also in efficient management of that system. And that's because we've never had an energy system with one vector. The resilience of our energy system is dependent on its diversity. And a hydrogen economy will complement increasing electrification by offering that diversity. So the question is no longer, is hydrogen the solution? It's really, what is the hydrogen solution going to look like? Is hydrogen um, mainly going to target those really hard to decarbonize applications like industry and heavy goods vehicles? 
or is it going to replace hydrocarbons at scale and heat our homes? Um, and for Scotland, the question really needs to be, how do we make the most of our natural capital and in particular our huge green energy resources and existing oil and gas infrastructure to maximise economic gain? Um, so at Arup, we were asked that particularly challenging question last year by Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And they recognise that hydrogen is going to play this key role and they're developing a policy framework that ensures that they can meet their decarbonisation targets, but also realise the full benefits of a green economy. And so they asked us to undertake a hydrogen assessment to inform their policy development, which is really what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the hydrogen assessment was threefold. Um, it set out the hydrogen baseline, so what aspects of our natural capital, skills, supply chain, resources, infrastructure, energy use would influence what hydrogen economy would look like in Scotland. Um, it also included scenario development, um, so we set out some distinct and diverse ways in which the hydrogen economy might develop out to 2045 in Scotland. And then finally, we undertook an impact assessment where we identified the socioeconomic benefits of those scenarios. And to inform the baseline, we looked at the evidence, um, but we also took a really extensive engagement with industry. And because the hydrogen economy touches on pretty much all parts of the economy, we had an incredibly diverse set of stakeholders from the renewable developers producing offshore wind through to the gas network operators, right down to the key users of hydrogen in heating homes and transport and pretty much everything in between. Um, so hydrogen, I'm gonna start right at the start, assuming that some of you are pretty new to the subject and then I'm gonna build a little on the detail. So hydrogen is the most, is the simplest and most abundant element in the universe. It's got a very high energy density by weight, um, but it's also the lightest gas, meaning its energy density by volume is low. Hydrogen fusion is the power of the sun, but it only occurs naturally on Earth when it's combined with other elements. So for example, water, H2O or methane, CH4. And due to this, sometimes people describe it as an energy vector, i.e. we don't go out and dig or drill for hydrogen, we have to input um, energy to create it in its elemental form prior to storing or using it. And use of hydrogen in the energy system isn't novel. In Scotland, hydrogen has been used as an early, as an energy vector since the early 1900s. Back then it was produced from coal in large gas works to create towns or coal gas, which was 50% hydrogen. And even today, hydrogen is used extensively as an industrial feedstock and it's produced in great quantities at industrial complexes like Grangemouth. Um, and because the picture speaks a thousand words, here's a visualization of the role that hydrogen can play in the energy system. So it can be be produced in a variety of ways, either using water and electricity or methane, and I'll describe those in a little detail, more detail later. You can transport it like any other gas in pipelines, great and cheap over long distances, but you can also transport it in road tankers over short distance or even vessels. Um, if stored correctly, it will stay in place over long periods of time with little leakage or degradation. And longer term, higher volume storage is likely to be geological, but short term, you can opt for the more expensive above ground storage tanks. And like natural gas, um, you have a proportion of the storage within the pipelines themselves. And hydrogen can be a great way to decarbonize our energy demands. Um, it's got potential applications in heat, transport, industry, electricity. And what's great about hydrogen is that it produces no carbon di dioxide emissions at the point of use. Um, so I talked a little bit in my introduction about the fact that the energy system is not and has never been dependent on a single vector and that hydrogen plays a key role in achieving net zero as part of a wider system when working together with increased electrification. Just taking a big a step back and looking at the wider energy system. This image shows how those vectors might work together. Um, and the ambition of our national energy policy is obviously that we decarbonize and, um, uh, and that we avert the catastrophic human and economic impacts of climate change. 
and that we do it in a way that minimises cost to consumers, which is a significant issue given the proportion of Scotland's um, population that live in fuel poverty. But we'd also like to invest where we can capture the widest economic benefits. And one of the really difficult and key challenges of policy setting in 2021 to achieve the system we want in 2045 or 2050 is the range of uncertainties that exist in solving that equation. And I could pull out for you a range of peer review reports that try and predict that optimal balance and they contradict each other. Um, and, and that's because of the complexity and uncertainty in undertaking those assessments. And the factors um, on the side give you a bit an idea of, of the complexity of those decisions. So as engineers, we might think we've come up with the best solution, but consumers don't like it and they won't buy it or adopt it. We might think it's too expensive today, but as it matures, its cost reductions might wholly outpace our predictions, which is really what happened with renewables. It might work in Glasgow, but it doesn't do the job in Inverness or in Orkney. So of course we need to take quick actions um, and we've got to make decisions on what solutions we are confident can deliver now and get on with them. But in areas where the answer is less clear, we need to work on building the evidence base, which sounds fine in practice, but actually we don't always have the opportunity to defer decisions because our 2030 decarbonisation targets are so challenging. And most technologies that are going to have a material impact on net zero need to be mainstream within the decade. So we've got this really tricky balance between making the right decision and making a timely decision. Um, so with that in mind, I'll get back again to hydrogen and the solutions and issues we're tackling in making decisions on where hydrogen will play a role. Um, so firstly, I mentioned that there were two main ways of producing hydrogen. Firstly, using natural gas as a feedstock and using the very mature and developed methane reformation technology, we can produce um, hydrogen. If we use it in combination with carbon capture and storage, it's low carbon and we call it blue. Without carbon capture and storage, um, it's known as grey. Um, and 95% uh, of the world's hydrogen production is grey and predominantly used in industry. Alternatively, we can take water, electricity and an electrolyzer and split hydrogen into an oxygen and produce what is known as green hydrogen. And this is also a surprisingly mature technology and again has been utilised commercially since the 1800s. However, the technology is still evolving and solutions which are optimised to work well with renewables um, are, at a very, are at an earlier commercial stage. Um, and there's loads of other ways that people subdivide these and use other colours, um, but I'm not going to get into that today. And if you want a comparison between the two, green is more expensive now, but be predicted to be cheaper in the long run because it's an evolving technology that's assumed to have some greater potential for learning. Its costs are really tied to electricity cost, which has been reducing. It's zero carbon, not just low carbon, and it produces hydrogen with higher purity, which matters for some applications more than others. So hydrogen boilers are more tolerant than hydrogen fuel cells um, used in transport. And we've got absolutely loads of it in the UK and in Scotland and way more than we could use nationally. Blue is cheaper now and we're likely to be able to scale up quickly because it's quite a mature technology. But because of the cost of carbon and natural gas and because it's a mature technology, its costs are not likely to decline. And if anything, they'll probably trend upwards. It's low carbon, not zero carbon. And depending on the carbon capture process, we might be able to achieve about um, a capture rate of 90 to 95% of the carbon. And that obviously requires more offsetting in a net zero world. So we'll need more tree planting and more BECs, so biomass and carbon capture and storage, which are carbon negative. Um, it's reliant on imports of gas and gas production in the North Sea is in decline. So scaling up blue hydrogen production means increasing reliance on gas imports. And it's less pure, although it can be cleaned up um, for things like fuel cell applications, um, which will add some cost. And the graph on the right um, shows what stakeholders in our engagement said about blue and green hydrogen. 
And while there was certainly some divergence, the general view was that green was definitely the ultimate solution, but that blue could play a key role in the short term. And I mentioned before the challenges that we have in determining the applications where hydrogen fits best. And this image shows a really simplified view of our confidence of where hydrogen is the better solution compared to the alternatives. So we've got existing hydrogen uses. They're using gray hydrogen. They're likely to be fulfilled only by hydrogen and should be switched to blue or green. Um, but in transport, there are also applications such as heavy goods vehicles and trains where electrification is really challenging and hydrogen might be economically or technically the best option. Then we move on to heating of all forms and the jury is really out and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then finally, there are applications like personal transport where EV is so far ahead that it seems unlikely that hydrogen will play a major role in the short term and power generation, which might play a role in the wider UK, but in Scotland, there's so much renewables that there's probably less of a case. And I think maybe to contextualize this, I wanted to give you just an idea of the order of magnitude of hydrogen's potential role in the energy system. So this is Scotland's 2017 energy demand, which is roughly about 160 terawatt hours, where we identified early areas in the energy system where there was a technically commercially easy transition. You can see these in dark green. Um, and then there's some areas where we think the applications are, are probably a bit more challenging, either from a technical or a commercial perspective, and they're in light green. Um, so we can see something like where rail and buses could play a really significant role early days of the industry in securing demand, actually, by 2045, they're really going to be a small contributor to um, carbon reduction targets. Um, and that gives you a really idea about, you know, where there might be quick early wins, but they're not massively eating into our carbon and where in the longer term we really need to focus our effort and, and be able to achieve those um, big hitter wins in terms of carbon reduction. Uh, so moving on to transport, I mentioned that heavy goods vehicles, electric alternatives aren't really there yet. So HGV weights create some huge range challenges for today's battery technology. Hydrogen offers quick refueling, just like conventional vehicles. So it's great for HGV and other commercial vehicles where you don't just want to sit about waiting for a charge for an extended period of time. Hydrogen's also potentially good for back to base fleets. So things like um, commercial and public sector, like buses, where you don't need an extensive refueling network. You just need to be able to provide hydrogen in a small number of locations where your fleet return to. Um, more broadly, there, there's obviously challenges around infrastructure as there is for any decarbonisation of transport. Um, so for heavy goods vehicles, we're likely to require a network of refueling stations that follow their transport routes. And because heavy goods vehicles generally move across Scotland, the UK and even the EU, we're likely to be reliant on development of a, ref a European um, refueling network if we want to deploy HGVs within Scotland. The public sector fleets are also really important in terms of securing demand. So one of the big issues for early stage projects is, is how you match that supply and demand. So how you have certainty in producing hydrogen because you know you've got a market um, to, to get it to. And the Aberdeen hub is a really great example of a growing public sector fleet, fleet that's creating that clear demand for hydrogen within the region and uh, creating a, a critical mass where other hydrogen projects can grow. Um, there's also cost is a really key factor to consider and where hydrogen plays a role. And transport fuel has a much higher cost base than gas does for heating our homes. So every time we use hydrogen for transport, there's an easier economic case than when we use hydrogen within, uh, within a heating application. Hydrogen trains may be a really good solution, you know, in particular on remote routes where it's likely to be more cost effective to use hydrogen re rolling stock than to, in, than to invest in the huge amount of capital 
to electrify a remote and not well utilised line. And the image here is an Arup and Arcola project funded by Scottish Government, University of St Andrews, where we're re retrofitting existing rolling stock with a hydrogen drivetrain to demonstrate the train on the Bonas and Canal Heritage Railway line just in time for COP26. And, and really that's about demonstrating the technology, but it's also about demonstrating that Scotland has the supply chain to be able to um, uh, deliver on um, economic benefit associated with these projects. And then I promised that I would come back to the very controversial heating topic. And in reality, there is no easy solution, but both hydrogen and electrification and a combination of both are being considered. So electricity seems like the obvious solution. If you produce green electricity, then why not use it directly in a very efficient heat pump? But the seasonal nature of heating creates a real challenge for storage, which electricity just doesn't do well over longer time frames. Um, it will also require a huge investment in growth of our electricity network to meet those peak, peak supply and peak demands within the network. Um, and heat pumps are very impactful on consumers. So it needs consumers to have really energy efficient homes and it can require them to need to implement substantial upgrades to their wider heating systems. So things like oversized radiators. Um, hydrogen, on the other hand, can be injected into the existing gas network. So you could do it 100% and change out consumers' boilers with hydrogen ones. Um, but we also think that you're going to be able to inject up to 20% by volume gas with existing appliances to reduce the carbon intensity of gas. So won't require a switch out um, of consumers' existing boilers. Obviously, by the time that you do go to 100%, you need all the consumers to switch at once, but the disruption within people's homes is likely to be less than the installation of a heat pump. Hydrogen can deal well with interseasonal storage. Gas is good at storage. Um, and you've got the benefit of utilising an asset you already have in the gas distribution and transmission network. But hydrogen is much higher cost than natural gas and probably more expensive than the unit cost of electricity. Um, so the image here is the H100 project in Fife and it's led by SGN, supported by Arup through design and development. And it includes the installation of a purpose-built hydrogen network, which aims to connect up to 300 homes in its first phase to supply with 100% hydrogen. It's funded by Ofgem and Scottish Government. And the reason why it's a new gas network is because for this trial, the idea is to allow consumers to be able to opt into the trial. However, longer term, the idea is to repurpose existing gas networks and a switch would require a mandated change, either to a hydrogen boiler or some other low carbon alternative. And this is, project is all about providing the evidence base and in particular really understanding consumer views on hydrogen and consumer readiness to adopt um, that technology. Um, and just to give you some context of the global picture of hydrogen, so Scotland and the UK aren't alone in recognising the potential for hydrogen and development of a hydrogen policy framework commitment to development of industry are coming thick and fast. Um, the focus on each strategy tends to be the creation of an indigenous market that aligns with that nation's natural capital. So as an example, if you look at Japan, the Tokyo Olympics has got a really strong hydrogen flavour, but they've really focused on transport and fuel cell applications, which is a match with their manufacturing capability, and they've committed equivalent of 1.3 billion euros um, for research and technology innovation. Um, and they're cooperating with Australia, whose focus is on the production of hydrogen um, to support the energy poor Japan, who don't have enough indigenous resources to be able to supply their energy needs through renewable, um, renewable or gas sources. Um, and similarly, if you look at South Korea, they're very transport focused, not surprising given their car industry. And they've got a target of 6.2 million uh, fuel cell vehicles um, to be delivered by 2040. And similarly, if you go back to the EU, 
Um, we're seeing coordination across the EU nations. There are strong commitments from Germany, the Netherlands, Norway. Germany have got a five gigawatt five gigawatt of green hydrogen by 2030 targets. They've committed 7 billion euros in, invest, um, in investment to develop their home markets. But again, we've seen this emerging trend in the need for international coordination for countries like Germany that, again, can't supply their own energy needs to achieve net zero with their own renewable resources. And they have identified the need to import hydrogen from other countries to meet net zero, which is, of course, very interesting to a nation like Scotland that has got more, more resources than they can use. But what does all of that mean for Scotland? So definitely the Scottish hydrogen story isn't just about the potential to decarbonise, it's really about using Scotland's natural capital to achieve a just transition. And why is hydrogen an exciting proposition for Scotland? Um, so firstly, we've got natural resources infrastructure for both blue and green, and that's relatively unique that we've got the potential for both and, and that can offer us some resilience. In terms of the blue hydrogen story, Scotland plays a key role in the existing gas market. Um, our resources and infrastructure mean that we can benefit from hydrocarbons in a more sustainable way. The green hydrogen story is around our significant natural resource and offshore onshore wind, marine renewables. In particular, we've got a capacity for offshore wind that's an order of magnitude beyond our Scottish demands. And hydrogen may offer us a route to market for this energy source in that European market that I was talking about earlier. And our existing skills in both oil and gas and renewables are highly transferable within this sector. So it can offer growth of indigenous schools, it can offer transition opportunities for those working in the oil and gas sector. And the global picture shows that we weren't, or that we're not alone in recognising the potential for hydrogen, but nor are we significantly behind. And the map shows some current and proposed hydrogen demonstrator projects. We actually published this a couple of months ago and it's already horribly out of date because new projects are popping up all the time. Um, and what's interesting about this is you can see some regional differences in the developing economy. So we've got things that are happening in the islands like um, Orkney and the Western Isles, where we've got we're looking at integrated energy systems, often tied to uh, green energy, balancing supply and demand. And then you've got things like the industrial clusters with hard to decarbonize activities matched with blue and sometimes green. So particularly places like the Northeast, but also Grangemouth and Shetlands. And then we've got some urban areas, dense demands in transport and gas heating, you know, real needs to um, accelerate their decarbonisation. Um, so our work looked at the evidence base and what the industry was telling us, and we developed a number of scenarios. And scenarios, I think, are much misunderstood because they're not derived from an assessment of the alternatives. They're not an optimization or prediction of the best outcome. What they're meant to do is represent credible but distinct alternatives. And the reality is the final outcome is likely to be somewhere in the middle. So we worked with stakeholders and the evidence base to build from the bottom up, looking at how we balance supply and demand out to 2025, 2032 and 2045. And we had three main scenarios we looked at. So a hydrogen economy, where hydrogen played a, just a really major role within our own energy system. It pretty much replaced gas and served a Scottish and UK market through a balanced mix of blue and green. Um, and it played a major role in heat and uh, industry, but also stretched right into transport. We then looked at a green export scenario where hydrogen dominated in transport, but Scotland played also played this really significant role in exporting to Europe. Um, we assumed that European market was served by green and not blue hydrogen because it appears that there's being a premium is going to be put on a zero rather than low carbon hydrogen. And what's absolutely critical to achieving this outcome is the ability to produce and transport hydrogen from Scotland's offshore wind than hydrogen from, say, solar in southern Europe or beyond. And finally, 
we looked at focused hydrogen, where hydrogen played a role in tackling the hard to decarbonize sectors. It's meeting a much smaller fraction of demand overall, um, but with a bit of a bias towards green being the, the ultimate um, major dominating uh, source of hydrogen. And these scenarios often obviously represented some really different skills of ambition and therefore the range of potential economic activity um, associated with them ranged as well from five to 25 billion. So um, just to close out, I'm not going to talk about these in too much detail um, as I want to leave plenty of time for questions. But these were some of the key messages that came through in terms of competing demands. And that is that hydrogen is part of the solution. And we've got this huge economic opportunity, which is driven largely by the production of hydrogen. And that's where we saw the, the biggest um, growth in jobs and GVA. If we move early, we're more likely to be able to secure more of the supply chain and realize more economic benefit. So we have to really understand the match between our natural capital, natural skills, and, and be able to invest in those areas. But we do need to recognize the uncertainty and we need to build the evidence base so that we're able to make robust and timely decisions and be able to achieve our 2030 and 2045 targets with the best solutions available. And all of that needs a really clear vision and strategy and coordination across industry um, and across sectors, which is challenging, um, giving, the, giving the breadth and, and complexity of, of all the associated industries. Um, so with that, I'm, I think happy to take uh, Q&As.